Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it is uh, 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 my great pleasure to have uh, a wonderful panelists here on the stage and also uh, to have uh, all of you uh, 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 participants. Uh, I, uh, my name is uh, Yoichi Ida, uh, the uh, Assistant Vice Minister at the Ministry of Internal Affairs and the Communications of the Japanese government. And uh, uh, this session uh, is uh, uh, talking about uh, the uh, uh, opportunities and the uh, uh, challenges, but mainly focusing on the opportunities uh, brought by generative AI and the foundation models, and uh, which uh, are uh, looking, uh, uh, having a, a great uh, uh, potential uh, for development of uh, society and the economy for us. And uh, uh, we have uh, a very uh, uh, prominent uh, speakers and uh, uh, representatives from different communities. And uh, uh, we will uh, this, uh, uh, have uh, uh, interaction between uh, these uh, uh, panelists uh, on the uh, potential uh, possibilities and the uh, uh, use uh, of those technologies uh, in the uh, different types of uh, 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 societies and the economies uh, with different conditions and backgrounds. So uh, uh, I would like to start with the, the uh, introduction by uh, each uh, speaker uh, from uh, uh, my side uh, to the end. So uh, I pass the microphone uh, to one uh, from one to another. Maybe uh, you take two, three minutes to introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. My name is Amrita Chaudhary. I come from India, I represent CCUI, which is a civil society organization. I am currently a MAG member um, and happy to be here. I also chair the Asia Pacific Regional IGF, amongst other hats I wear, and I pass it on to the next fellow panelist. Good evening, everyone. I'm Melinda Claybaugh. I'm a director of privacy policy at Meta, and I look after uh, AI and data regulation globally. Hi, I am Hiroshi Maruyama. I work for a preferred networks, and uh, my background is software. I spent 26 years at IBM Research. Now I work for uh, the preferred networks as a director, uh, part-time as well as I work for a Kaho Corporation, which is a chemical company uh, for uh, daily products like uh, shampoo and soap. I'm Natasha Crampton, Microsoft's Chief Responsible AI Officer. I have two parts to my job. The first part is an internal facing uh, part to my job where I help our engineering teams um, implement our responsible AI principles and commitments by defining the policies and the governance approach that we have across the company. And then in my external facing role, I try to take what we've learned from building AI systems responsibly and move that into the public policy discussion about what the new laws and norms and standards ought to be in this space. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Boni Pujianto from the Ministry of Communication and Informatics, Indonesia. So I have two role of my responsibility first is uh, related to the digital literacy, which is to encourage people much more having capability on the IT sector for all the people. And secondly, also related to the startup ecosystem. That's my primary responsibility. Thank you. Hi, good evening. I'm Luciano Maza. I'm with the Brazilian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm the Director for Science, Technology and Innovation and Intellectual Property. And although uh, the title of the, of the job does not say it, that's the department in our ministry that is responsible for all things digital. So anything that relates to digital economy, digital transformation, internet governance, and also 
disruptive technologies. So that's part of our remit. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and let's hope, looking forward to a good discussion. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Daisuke Hayashi from the World Bank. I'm uh, kind of title is a Senior Digital Development Specialist. And uh, I'm very happy to be here uh, with this, this excellent uh, panelist colleagues here. And I engage in the kind of more uh, in digital infrastructure and also the international uh, cooperation and as well as the digital skills scaling up uh, issues. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, the uh, panelists. Uh, and uh, as you see, uh, we have a very uh, excellent set of panelists uh, from different communities and the different regions of the world. And uh, uh, before uh, uh, starting the question and the answer uh, uh, between uh, uh, panelists, uh, I would, uh, let me briefly introduce uh, uh, what uh, uh, our uh, government uh, has been uh, uh, making our efforts uh, in promoting uh, AI uh, governance uh, uh, across the world uh, through uh, uh, mainly uh, G7 uh, uh, framework. Uh, as uh, uh, many of you uh, are aware, uh, the Japan is taking the uh, role of uh, G7 presidency this year. Uh, we had the uh, digital and the tech ministers meeting uh, at the end of April. Through the uh, preparation, uh, we have been discussing uh, global AI governance. In the beginning, uh, the uh, object, uh, objective of the discussion was a kind of uh, to bridge the gaps between different uh, policy frameworks and the regulations across G7 members. Uh, because uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, the European uh, 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 EU and the European countries are, are heading uh, for the uh, legally binding framework, while uh, US, Japan, and other members are maintaining, at, that, at, at least at that time, uh, the uh, uh, non-binding soft law approach uh, in AI governance. And uh, my uh, uh, objective was uh, to keep this group uh, uh, sh to share the same uh, policy direction. And in the beginning, uh, uh, we encouraged uh, Ro European colleagues uh, to, to uh, 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 admit the importance of open and uh, enabling a free environment for innovation through uh, uh, AI technology uh, based on uh, a soft law approach. Uh, uh, as uh, you may know, uh, uh, even uh, under the uh, EU AI Act framework, uh, the uh, proportion of uh, regulated AI uh, will be limited. And uh, according to their explanation, uh, the, uh, most of the AI uh, technology and the AI systems uh, will be uh, 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 mostly free to, to provide and free to use. Uh, uh, they only regulate uh, uh, the AI systems with, with high risks. And in some cases, uh, they, uh, they consider uh, risks as un unacceptable. But uh, in most cases, uh, the AI systems are, are free in the market. So. Uh, not not uh, free doesn't mean uh, free of charge, but uh, uh, free from regulation, of course. So uh, uh, we wanted to share this direction, but you know, uh, when they are uh, discussing internally uh, the uh, introduction of the legally binding uh, framework, it was a little bit difficult uh, for us to find a landing point uh, uh, be uh, between the uh, uh, different uh, approaches. So uh, we changed the direction of the discussion, and G7 agreed at the end uh, uh, the importance uh, of uh, uh, interoperability between different uh, uh, policy frameworks. Uh, even if uh, you have a binding, uh, a legally binding approach, or you have soft law-based approach, 
uh, we believe uh, interoperability and transparency between different frameworks, between different jurisdictions, is very important. So that uh, the different, uh, the various players in AI ecosystem uh, can uh, could uh, maintain or uh, uh, could ensure uh, the uh, 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 predictability and transparency uh, uh, of uh, uh, different. Uh, 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 le uh, uh, legal and uh, policy frameworks. So that was the discussion uh, at uh, G7 uh, digital and tech uh, ministers uh, meeting. And uh, uh, in the middle of the discussion, we saw the rapid rise uh, of uh, uh, generative AI in the market and uh, uh, rapid expansion uh, across the society. So uh, we decided to discuss uh, how uh, we could uh, improve the governance of this very powerful technology of generative AI. But uh, uh, we didn't have enough time because it came up uh, all of a sudden in the middle of probably March or uh, even April. And our ministers met uh, at the end of April. So we decided, our ministers decided to continue our discussion and efforts beyond uh, 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 our ministers' meeting and also beyond the uh, leaders' summit uh, in the middle of uh, May this year. Leaders uh, agreed to continue the work and directed the relevant ministers to continue the work uh, 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 toward the end of the year, and they named this initiative as Pro Hiroshima uh, AI uh, process. So Hiroshima AI process uh, was launched at the end of May, and uh, uh, we have been having uh, uh, the dozens of working group meetings uh, uh, online uh, from uh, June through to uh, up on actually up until now. And uh, we have been discussing what are the priority risks and the challenges uh, brought by generative AI, what are the opportunities, and how we could address those risks and the challenges, and what would be the good approaches, in particular when we do not have clear answer uh, in addressing those issues and the risks, uh, such as uh, lack of transparency or expansion of disinformation, misinformation, which are relatively new to us and brought by generative AI and the foundation models. So uh, we are continuing our discussion actually, but uh, uh, in the beginning of September, as you, uh, some of you may know, uh, 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 our ministers met online to exchange and uh, confirm the interim uh, 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 outcome from uh, the discussion. Uh, we had uh, uh, the minister's statement, which included 10 items as priorities. They included the risk countermeasures to the risks and the challenges by generative AI and companies and uh, AI actors uh, should consider tho uh, the, uh, uh, those uh, uh, measures uh, uh, before uh, they develop and launch their uh, models and the systems and before they put them into the market and also uh, they, uh, those companies and organizations should continue their efforts uh, uh, after the launch of uh, AI systems, uh, uh, so, so on and so forth. Uh, we have 10 uh, uh, key elements uh, which you can see uh, on the website of our ministry. And uh, uh, these uh, 10 elements are still being discussed uh, uh, at our working group to uh, be more elaborated with the content. And uh, we are now uh, uh, trying to, to find uh, a set of a little bit high level guiding principles for 
players such as uh, organizations developing uh, generative AI and the foundation model and uh, even the new type of AI systems uh, which may come uh, up uh, uh, in the near future. And uh, we are also start, uh, 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 discussing uh, the uh, action level uh, of uh, 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 code of conduct, which uh, will uh, articulate how those AI actors can uh, implement those high-level uh, guiding uh, principles. Uh, our working group is now discussing uh, uh, the, uh, those uh, principles, high-level principles and action-level uh, 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 code of conduct uh, uh, with the organizations and the players uh, developing AI systems because uh, the working group believed uh, the uh, uh, development stage uh, of AI systems is most urgent uh, priority for us. But uh, at the same time, uh, we believe uh, uh, different uh, uh, actors in AI ecosystem, uh, I mean the AI service providers, AI deployers, or AI users, AI end users, all of those uh, AI actors are should be also uh, responsible uh, in their uh, engagement uh, with uh, generative AI and uh, advanced AI systems. So uh, in the second half of our work, uh, we will be working uh, on uh, principles for other AI uh, actors than uh, AI developers. But up until now, we are more or less focusing on the players uh, developing AI systems and uh, 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 generative, uh, including AI, generative AI and uh, uh, AI uh, advanced, uh, I'm sorry, uh, foundation models. That is uh, what uh, uh, I, uh, we have been doing uh, uh, from the beginning of the year uh, as a, a G7 framework but uh, uh, we, at the same time, recognize uh, G7 is a small group in the world. And uh, 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 in our discussion, uh, 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 everybody recognizes the importance of multi-stakeholder dialogue and dialogue with players, from, uh, with partners beyond G7 group. So, this session is one of the very first steps uh, uh, for us to share our idea and uh, uh, to, to, to uh, uh, start our discussion with the different uh, 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 players uh, in the AI ecosystem. This is just an introduction and I'm, I'm very sorry I'm taking too much, uh, a little bit longer than I uh, expected, but uh, in this session, uh, having said this, uh, introduced our efforts up until now, we are trying to focus on the, uh, in particular, positive side of uh, new uh, AI uh, applications, new AI uh, systems, uh, and uh, 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 because uh, we often talk about the risks and the challenges, but when we talk about the risks and the challenges, uh, the purpose of the discussion is we want to know how uh, we could make best use of uh, this uh, benefit of this technology uh, while uh, uh, addressing the potential risks and the challenges. We all know uh, even if there would be a, a enormous uh, a benefit and the potential, if there is a risk and a challenge uh, 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 waiting for us. Uh, people uh, are not comfortable in uh, actively using the technology. So uh, uh, that is why we discuss risks and the challenges, but the ultimate purpose is how we can make use of those the new technologies through innovation to improve our economy, uh, society and uh, 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 develop our economy. 
And this is true not only to the developed countries, but of course true to all the different uh, communities and the societies across the globe. So now uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, our uh, 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 excellent uh, panelists to share what kind of uh, benefits and what kind of potentials uh, 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 your uh, uh, companies, services, and the technologies uh, and systems are now uh, uh, brought to the society through your services, and also uh, what uh, kind of uh, uh, benefits or uh, potentials you are thinking of, planning of, to bring to the society. So first, uh, I would like to invite three AI companies uh, to share the uh, information on your current services or solutions you are providing uh, in the market and uh, uh, what types of uh, new benefit or uh, uh, development or advantages you are thinking of bringing through your uh, newly developed uh, services or technologies. So, First, I would like to uh, invite uh, uh, Melinda from, uh, from my side to, 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 uh, uh, to the end. So uh, first, I, uh, I invite Melinda, followed by uh, Mariama-san, and then uh, 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 Natasha. So Melinda, please. Thank you so much. So I want to share some of the AI products and developments that Meta has been developing. Um, and they fall into a few buckets. So the first bucket, probably not surprisingly, is, is what's core to our business in terms of helping people connect with each other, which is our mission. So we recently, um, a couple weeks ago, released a suite of new generative AI products that you can use in our existing apps and services, WhatsApp, Facebook, Instagram. And these are AI agents that you can interact with, have fun, ask, ask questions, get information. Uh, we also launched generative AI products that allow you to make images um, that you can share with your friends and family in our products. Um, and you can make stickers and fun things that you can, that already integrate with our products that allow you to just have fun, enjoy with your friends and family. And that's really core to our business and, and furthering the experiences that people have in our apps. But there's also two other types of deep investments that we're making in AI that I want to highlight. So another area is around um, investing in open source tools and products. And so this is really about unlocking innovation globally and helping people take advantage of AI tools and democratizing access to AI tools. So I first wanna call out um, something that we released this summer, which is a, a large language model called Llama 2. Um, and this is a, a, a large language model that we made available uh, op on an open source basis um, this summer. Anyone can download it and use it depending on you know, you can download in different sizes depending on your computing capability. And you can build things on top of it. On top of it. You can build generative AI products on top of it. Um, and actually, a really exciting development is that a couple days ago, we launched what's called our Llama Impact Challenge. And we're seeking um, applications from anyone who wants to propose a compelling use for Llama to solve a societal challenge. In particular, we're looking for applications in the areas of education, the environment, and open innovation generally. So think about, for example, in the area of education, how you might use our large language model to support teachers or students in a particular learning environment. Um, in the area of the environment, how might you use our open source model to um, understand uh, how we can adapt to climate change, um, to understand how we might um, prepare ourselves uh, for climate effects, and how we might mitigate um, or remove greenhouse gases from the environment. These are all things that can be 
uh, propelled and powered by large language models. And so we're very interested to see what people might come up with and the most compelling ideas we will fund and provide grants to. So that's just an example of how we're hoping to open up access to really powerful tools, particularly to solve um, societal challenges. And this is something that we committed to as part of the White House commitments um, that we signed in July along with other companies, <laughs> including Microsoft. And one of the voluntary commitments that we agreed to is investing in research um, to understand and advance uh, to, to advance uh, solutions to um, societal challenges, and we th think this is a really powerful way to do that. Um, the other thing, the, the third bucket I wanted to raise around our approach to AI and, and investments in, in AI is our Data for Good program. And so just a couple things I wanna highlight from there. Um, one is something that we have, a program we have called No Language Left Behind. This is a first-of-its-kind project that open sources models capable of delivering high-quality translation, translations directly between 200 languages, including low-resource languages. Um, it aims to give people the opportunity to access and share web content um, in their native language and communicate with anyone, anywhere, regardless of their language abilities. We then use those learnings from that program and feed that back into our products in order to improve our product experiences for communities around the world. I also wanted to share one final program that we have called uh, the Relative Wealth Index. And this leverages artificial neural networks to analyze images that help identify poverty at a sub-neighborhood level. That information is then used by governments to increase coverage for social protection programs and make them available to a wider set of populations that need the support most. So from, from fun generative AI practices uh, on the one hand to um, really grappling with um, critical social problems that we face um, around the world, I think we can start to see really the, the benefits of generative AI globally. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Melinda, for the very uh, interesting examples. So now I, uh, let me invite uh, Mariama-san to, to give you a, a story. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, our company is a little bit late in terms of coming to uh, large language models. Uh, we have released uh, our open source large language model two weeks ago. Uh, and we are going to demonstrate uh, the applications of these language models in various domains next week in a CTEC exhibition. But today I would like to focus on two direction, technological directions that we are uh, investing on, uh, which is uh, the first one is uh, the hardware. You know, Chat GPT is a significant breakthrough, but uh, there are uh, more innovations to come. And one of the new discoveries of ChatGPT or large language model is uh, something called the uh, scalability law, uh, which means you know, more parameters, like the billion parameters, uh, more data, and more computational power uh, is the key to emergent capabilities, such as uh, command of language in this case. But this means that if we put more computations, like a you know, hundred times larger computation power, then uh, we may expect the next level emergent property, uh, which is oops, uh, uh, whatever it is. That's the reason why uh, we invest heavy on uh, in soft, uh, hardware. Uh, we started as a software company, but we found that our current hardware technology is too expensive as well as too energy consuming. So we developed our own accelerator and uh, which enables us to win the world uh, most energy efficient supercomputers in green, green 500 uh, supercomputer ranking. Uh, using our next generation hardware, we will make the next breakthrough in AI. So that's the first area uh, of our investment. The second uh, area is the domains uh, to apply the generative model uh, thinking. 
Uh, generative AI is currently around the world of uh, human perception, like in language, you know, text, image, voice, uh, etc. But there are other domains uh, which is not uh, very much uh, familiar with uh, human beings. Uh, for example, in different scales. And looking at the molecular scale, scales, uh, we uh, have our, uh, the, a software as a service called Matlantis for uh, uh, materials informatics. And uh, we use uh, uh, deep learning uh, technologies to accelerate the speed of the search of new materials by uh, 1,000 times or 10,000 times compared to the traditional uh, a, um, uh, 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 first principle based uh, calculations, simulations, I mean. Uh, Another example of uh, the different domain is in highly complex systems like in, in the human body, the biological systems. As I said, I uh, also work for Kao Corporation and with Kao, uh, collaboration with Kao and uh, preferred networks, uh, we developed the so-called virtual human generative model. Uh, I think you are familiar with the uh, generative, image generative models such as uh, Mid Journey. Uh, it generates an image, for example, uh, 100 pixel by 100 pixel. Uh, each pixel represents the brightness of that dot. But suppose that uh, if you replace this image brightness with uh, human body measurements, like an age, or sex, or blood pressure, or glucose level, and, and so on. So we defined uh, about 2,000 different attributes uh, that is observable uh, from human body and created a generative model out of this data. And this is in a very interesting and general purpose model uh, which can, be, uh, can have uh, many different applications such as, for example, you know, I am a 65 male, uh, what is uh, the average uh, blood pressure uh, in my age? And that kind of question can be easily uh, uh, done by uh, this you know, uh, generative model. So we, we apply the technology to other domains beyond human perception. Of course, in, it's, it's fun to watch the machines doing uh, what a human can do, but let the machine do what mere human cannot do is I think that, uh, another way to going forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Moriyama-san uh, for, for for uh, various uh, types of uh, 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 applications and the solutions. And now I would like to invite Natasha uh, to, to, to share your uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, do you mean the previous speaker? Oh, okay, okay. So I, I uh this is a collaboration with the Kao Corporation and the Preferred Networks. And the Thank you very much. So I'm Natasha Crunch, I'm from Microsoft. I'm incredibly optimistic uh, about AI's potential to help us have a healthier, more sustainable, more inclusive future. And in fact, that's what motivates me to do the work that I do within the company to ensure that that technology is safe and secure and, and trustworthy. And I think what's exciting about the current moment is that you don't just have to um, imagine potential use cases for AI, there are real use cases today that are making a difference. So at Microsoft, we've been building a suite of co-pilots. Um, they're very intentionally called co-pilots, our products that uh, in incorporate the latest generation of AI because they're all about combining the best of humans and machines. So if you take your Microsoft uh, products that many of us uh, know and use every day, things like Outlook or Teams or Word, we're adding AI-powered assistance to those programs, which allow you to do things like Instead of uh, writing a long, lengthy email, you can just add in three bullet points and then it, the co-pilot will help you expand those bullet points into a first draft, which you can then look at and decide what to do. You can take a Word document 
and put it into the PowerPoint Copilot and it will generate a first draft of a slide deck based on that Word document. Or if you're like me and sometimes you run a little bit late to some meetings and you join a Teams meeting five minutes into the meeting, you can get a summary of what's already happened in that meeting using the Copilot in Teams. In addition to adding Copilots to the Microsoft Office products that we all uh, know well, we've also created whole new products, uh, which our customers are very much enjoying right now. An example of that is uh, a product called GitHub Copilot. This is a product that allows you to uh, type in plain language and generate code. And it's uh, an incredibly democratizing product in the sense that you no longer need to be a coder in order to code, you simply need to be able to issue instructions, describe the outcome that you want to achieve, and the code will be generated. And we're finding that with that type of uh, product, uh, it's both uh, welcomed by uh, new to coding uh, individuals, people who do not have expertise in coding, but we also hear from very experienced coders uh, at the level of, uh, you know, coders who work on, say, Tesla's autopilot system, so very sophisticated uh, AI operators, that they too find it very, very uh, useful in their work. So we have that, that suite of products, the Copilot suite, and we just think together these products help uh, users be more creative, they help them do things that they might not have been able to do before, and more productive, at, and especially at a time when you know, many countries are grappling with major population shifts in many developed countries, a shrinking of uh, the population that's of working age. Uh, these types of productivity enhancing applications of AI are, are really meaningful. In addition to those co-pilots, we also make available the basic building blocks of this technology. So we're working very closely with our partner, OpenAI, um, who you may be familiar with as uh, the developers of ChatGPT. OpenAI has made available a number of different models, um, which we make available as building blocks, and then our customers and our partners come up with all sorts of exciting applications on top of those. I just want to mention two um, examples to you now, which I think give you a flavor for the, some of the potential that lies ahead with these models. So there's a Danish startup called Be My Eyes. Uh, they were established in, in 2012, uh, and they have been providing services to people who are blind or low vision. And they set up a program whereby uh, people who were blind or low vision were partnered with sighted volunteers so that the volunteers could help navigate um, an airport, help identify a product. Uh, Microsoft was involved early in this program by making sure that our experts on Microsoft uh, technology products were able to help explain how to use uh, technology to people who were blind or low vision. So this was a very successful program, um, but it really got a step change and was able to be made available much, much more broadly just earlier this year when OpenAI made available a model called GPT-V. It's a vision model, and it allows uh, an, an image to be ingested and then described in text. So in practice, what you can do with this technology is something like open your refrigerator door, take a photo of what's inside your refrigerator, the model will analyze the image, recognize the items in your fridge, and then suggest recipes uh, for what you might be able to uh, cook that evening uh, for your meal. Now, of course, this is not just helpful to people who are blind or low vision. This has everyday applications for many of us. So I think that's the one example of a, uh, an exciting application where it's meeting a real community need. It's serving 250 million people who are blind or low vision, but it also has broad application uh, that we all benefit from. So if we move from uh, Denmark, where that startup is based, uh, to India, 
in a, a, a town called Biwan that's about two hours outside of New Delhi. This is an arid family, uh, farming village, and, and the farmers there are facing a number of challenges. They're facing challenges like uh, applying for pensions on behalf of their aging parents. Uh, their government assistance payments have stopped. Uh, they want to be able to uh, apply, in some cases, for their children to get scholarships to go to university. But in reality, there's, in, these, in this particular village, there's both a linguistic and a technology divide. So English is often the language of public life, of government life in India, and yet only 11% of the population speaks English. So into this situation enters uh, a, a new uh, offering based on OpenAI's ChatGPT technology and built on Microsoft's cloud, which is called Dougal Bandy. And it's a chatbot that is allowing much, much greater access to government services than what was previously available. So users of this chatbot can ask uh, questions uh, in multiple languages. Um, it, it turns out that India has 22 constitutionally recognized languages, but in practice, somewhere between 100 and 120 spoken languages. So. This bot is able to uh, operate in a language of the user's choosing. You can speak into uh, the um, interface and it will convert your speech into text or you can type, which again overcomes uh, a, a, a literacy hurdle. This bot then retrieves the relevant information, which is usually made available in English and translates it back into local language. So that's one implementation of uh, a bot in India that's helping those farmers meet those needs to get pension payments, to get their government uh, assistance program uh, uh, stipends to make sure that university students are able to access that funding. But you can really imagine how that framework um, could be used in many other parts of the world as well. And it's exactly those sorts of democratizing uh, applications of AI that I'm really excited about. Okay, thank you very much for very interesting uh, examples uh, in uh, various fields and in uh, various uh, regions. So having listened to three speakers from uh, AI industry, uh, we have learned a lot uh, about the, the current uh, uh, situation in the AI-based services and the solutions uh, and the possibilities in the near future. So uh, now uh, I would like to invite the speakers uh, from uh, uh, emerging economies and the developing countries who are, uh, are expecting uh, uh, the uh, having uh, some uh, potential solutions or uh, uh, future services to address uh, their uh, 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 challenges and uh, uh, problems in, in their society or economy. And uh, uh, maybe that uh, would give us some hint to think about uh, future collaboration. So in the beginning, from my side once again, uh, let me invite uh, Amrita to share your idea. Thank you. Um, so if I look at the developing country perspective, and I think it's a global phenomena, and correct me if I'm wrong, most countries understand the power of technology, and they want to leapfrog their development. For example, they do understand um, technology can help them leapfrog. Uh, they understand the power of technology and they want to take, uh, including AI, which is the flavor of the season, I would say, um, and use it uh, in a better way because um, we do see a trend. The countries who are using technology or even AI um, and the countries who are not, the divide is increasing and we don't want that to happen. So. Um, if I look at countries such as India, as in just now, it was mentioned that uh, AI is also being used for good. 
uh, for example, agriculture, I would take that example. And just a correction, Indian government websites are bilingual or trilingual, but the end-to-end -end process may not be uh, complete, but they do have the local language, the official ones. Um, if you look at countries such as India, where the population is exploding, I would say, land is, uh, you know, decreasing because of urbanization and everything. Um, agriculture is using, a, uh, you know, they are using it for smart farming, how to use uh, better terrains, what kind of crops to be used. It is using, used even in climate control. For example, we are seeing the global warming, actual changes happening in, uh, you know, you have unprecedented weather, etc., coming even for fishermen. So these are places where it can use and it can maximize benefits. Um, you can use it in the public distribution systems if you use the data sets correctly. Uh, I would add the caveat that it can be used for good provided the right data sets are being used. So governments understand that they want to use it. Um, but obviously the technology may not be with everyone. There needs more information sharing. But I think the questions are that um, you know, is is the process transparent? Is the systems, you know, the data in which the way it's used, is it accountable? Um, what are, I would say, the algorithms which are being used? Because there are concerns which governments are coming up with, which is, you know, the biases in the system. It could be racial biases. It could be systemic biases. It could be any kind of biases coming up. Um, and, you know, just like, you know, an example was given that medical can use these data sets, um, you know, for healthcare, especially where you have limited doctors or physicians. But we also need to realize, uh, for example, someone in a particular region, let's take Japan, the constitution or the genealogy of the person may be pretty different from a European or from for even an Indian. So the same set of patterns may not work for everyone. It would have to be customized locally for those uh, kind of genealogy. And it happens for everything else. Um, so the data sets need to be of that place. For example, many times we've seen um, many of the algorithms which are used are from Global North. It doesn't work in Global South, or I would say the majority places. Um, if I take Asia Pacific, for example, we are very diverse. We have countries such as Japan, and we have the Pacific Islands who are kind of on the process of development. We have different cultures, races. Um, so, you know, when you have systems working, they need to respect the culture of the place. Um, that's very important. What works in some place may not. There is no right and wrong in this. This is the, how the places are, so we need to respect those. So I think those are the concerns which come in, but it can be used for good, and I think what is needed is, um, you know, if you look at, if you speak to youngsters, they're using chat GPT for their answers, they're chat, using it for many things, but it has much more better, you, as in it can be used much more. And I think those things needs to be spoken about, how it can be used, perhaps even companies speaking to the regulators, policy makers, or even civil society, etc., and understanding, you know, what are the needs, um, Everyone comes up with good intentions, but when it comes into, um, you know, reality, it may be used in different ways. For example, many countries are coming up for elections. I hope it's not being used, as you were saying, mis spreading misinformation or disinformation. Uh, so how can those be avoided and it can be used in a proper way is something. And perhaps uh, would you like me, uh, you know, there needs to be more collaboration and I think capacity building. Um, especially for decision makers, how technologies work, what, uh, you know, what are the pluses, what are the concerns. Um, and as you mentioned, uh, it's important that um, AI or generative AI is growing. We really don't know how it will shape up. So I think having um, guidelines for actually, you know, so that it is used properly makes more sense than try to stifle it because if we look at um, emerging countries, they want uh, small and medium enterprises growing, they want innovation to happen in those places. Uh, so sometimes if we try to restrict things, it may counter affect the aspirations of that country. So I think having more frameworks, more dialogues, uh, sharing best practices, 
um, is a good way. And perhaps if we have some time, I would share that uh, at the IGF, we have the policy network on AI, which is working on three main parameters. And we do have a discussion um, on the 11th. It's on interoperability uh, because you know you have different governance structures coming up, different um, you know OECD coming up, uh, and others coming up with frameworks. But each of them needs to have some converging points. So that's what is being tried to look at. Uh, gender and race biases, you know, how can you kind of mitigate it a bit lesser is something which needs to, is it's looking and how AI can be used for environment. So, and this has a global uh, south lens because the, it has been argued many times that many of the researches which are coming is more global north, but the majority countries are not taken into consideration. So that's where it comes. And I think if even the Hiroshima dialogue is expanding and trying to get developed nations into the discussion, that's good because else it remains an exclusive club of seven countries. Uh, whereas, uh, you know, the power shifts are happening and there are other countries who are coming up. Uh, so um, it would be good not only having the countries but also different stakeholders. Uh, for example, if you have the public industry who's innovating, the government who regulates, even civil society or academia who come up with the data in the same room, that helps. And I think those dialogues and the capacity building is important um, because uh, the train has left the station, it will go further, you can't stop something. But how you regulate the movement of the train in a positive way is something which needs to be looked at. And I think I would end it at there. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so, uh, Wilang, uh, uh, the uh, AI is not almighty, but uh, when it's uh, uh, tailored or localized uh, uh, according to the conditions of the co communities and the societies, uh, that would be a, a powerful instrument to, to give, uh, bring some uh, innovation or uh, improvement to the, the community. And uh, 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 as pointed out, uh, G7 uh, never tried to be exclusive club of a small number of countries, but uh, we are uh, always looking outward and uh, we are uh, always uh, 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 looking to uh, collaboration with uh, uh, various partners. So thank you very much for the comment, and I would like to invite uh, 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 Mr. Mata Luciano, uh, uh, director from uh, uh, the Foreign Ministry of Brazil. Uh, 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 oh, okay, I'm sorry, uh, I skipped my... Okay, uh, so may, may I invite uh, 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 first uh, uh, Bonisan? Uh, from Indonesia, and then uh, 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 Luciano. So, Bonisang, uh, from uh, uh, the Ministry of uh, 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 I, uh, uh, Communication and uh, IT uh, from Indonesia government. So, Bonisang, uh, floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Um, yes, everybody knows that the AI now becoming a very well-known and very useful for our society. And it's also going very fast because the technology itself, it is evolved and giving a huge impact to all, all society. Um, AI technology has begun applied in various sectors in Indonesia, starting from the uh, improved access to the healthcare because Indonesia is an archipelagic, we have thousands of islands, so we have to have like a solution for each individual citizen, even though they are in the remote area. Infrastructure, yes, it was the beginning obstacles, but now and then at the end, we have to provide like a solution for doctors, medical health care, for the patient in the remote area. Secondly, in education and skill development, because the young generation is also scattered in many areas. So uh, recently, there are sort of a solution provided by the startup companies to provide like an online courses, which is uh, suitable for those who are not living in the major city. Either. This is dedicated for those in uh, rural area with the suitable content. And also we have 
uh, some of the solution for AI in the, to alleviate the uh, poverty. And then the interesting thing is in environmental, humanitarian aid and disaster response, including the early warning system. Because nowadays, uh, due to the uh, heat wave in Indonesia and surrounding Southeast Asia, there are quite plenty of, uh, from the aspect of, um, how to say, like a fire in the, uh, uh, in the desert area and then also a problem in the uh, environmental. So the solution itself should be developed. It's not only from the government side, but also from the private sector. In the meantime, the innovation from startup has delivered a good and significant innovation and invention by utili utilizing AI. And they also has um, shown a significant contribution in solving those problem and increasing the quality of service as well as the uh, productivity. Um, these are some of the example, the implementation of AI and which is being used widely. However, um, we also, some of the uh, stakeholders uh, having some concern uh, about the uh, utilizing AI. So from the regulatory perspective, academics, practitioners, as well as civil society, they concern to ensure that the utilization of AI should be attention and consider of individual right and ethics. So uh, fortunately, uh, we just established the National Artificial Intelligence Strategy in 2020. Um, it's now being prepared to formulate into a presidential regulation. And from the business activities during 20 and up to 2022, they also uh, consider to be prepared a derivative regulation related to norm and then standard procedure and criteria or kind of a code of conduct. So from the regulatory point of view, we are formulating a guide of ethical values that can be uh, part of references for businesses actors. It, uh, this is very essential because uh, the uh, company and other institution should obey about regarding data and internal ethics uh, as a field of artificial intelligence. So quite plenty of innovation has been made, but we have to uh, put attention in the ethical value guidelines. It's including the inclusivity, humanity, security, democracy, openness, as well as uh, credibility and accountability. This is the basic values of the norm in the Indonesian nation. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bonnie san uh, Sorry about my mistake, but uh, uh, we heard a very uh, interesting uh, uh, report from your country. And uh, uh, now uh, I invite uh, Luciano uh, uh, you, uh, about uh, your uh, expectation and uh, uh, foresight. Sorry, I was off. Uh, thank you very much, Yoshi. Uh, well, I think my colleagues and previous speakers uh, covered some interesting issues that I wanted to, to touch upon a little bit as well. Uh, of course, we think about uh, areas where AI can be most effective uh, in addressing challenges and, and problems in our countries, in different countries. I think it's, it's important to bear in mind that what is a priority in one country is, is completely different from, from others. And, and in this case, I think to, to, to understand the priorities for developing countries are probably a lot different than, than priorities for, for, for most developed countries. Uh, so 
considering specific areas where uh, we see uh, a lot of potential to, to, to employment in, in, in Brazil, I think there are obvious uh, uh, topics and one that is not normally or not much mentioned when we think about uh, more uh, concerns that are more clear to, to develop the economies. I think food security and agriculture is certainly one of them and I think our, uh, Amrita mentioned this issue. Uh, health and education issues, of course, a lot of examples were, were, were brought about uh, uh, on this topic. And probably uh, one area that we, we see a lot of potential is uh, leveraging AI solutions to improve the provision of public services. So I think e-government in general, uh, and also the very use of, of, of AI for, for the, pub, the workings of the public service, some areas increasing in productivity and, and efficiency, so on and so forth. Uh, but again, I think something that is, it was, it was uh, referred to before, I think it's important to mention, uh, for, for developing countries having uh, the adequate capabilities uh, and governance frameworks, both in government and outside government, is, is, is crucial. And I think that's come first, because without this, it would be very hard to, to make sure we can benefit from, from all these this, this positive uh, uh, perspectives that we see. So without this prerequisite infrastructure, uh, it will be very hard to take full advantage of the, the benefits that the AI can, can bring. Uh, one aspect that was mentioned, I think Brazil, we have an AI strategy that is very much focused on innovation. Uh, and we also have a lot of uh, a legal framework that is there to boost uh, startup innovation. And Brazil has a dynamic uh, innovation ecosystem. And that I think that fits in well with some of the comments that I made before. Because I think one big challenge is how you can make AI more local. And we need to bring a sense of ownership of those models to countries where probably we're not developing our own uh, big, large language models. It's very unlikely that every developing country will have its own or have uh, big firms that will develop their own systems. So I think a crucial thing will be uh, how those models are adapted for local needs and for local communities. And then I think that was mentioned that, 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 that these this, this models based on, on, on open source systems is something that I think is important because uh, I think that's the, the entry point for local innovation. Uh, and I think that's something that is, is, makes sense and that I think is where uh, we see a potential to, to liaise with the local innovation ecosystems. And I think that's something that would, would be important. But it's something that must be taken into account as well is, uh, of course, it was mentioned by Amrita, that this, uh, these models, they are trained based on data that's normally uh, not, that does not come from developing countries. And I think that's a challenge that we have to face somehow. And when we develop these local solutions and local applications, uh, it's important to find ways to make sure that we can also uh, bring these perspectives to the data that in which uh, those models are trained. Because of course we're, we're talking about uh, troves of data that do not necessarily reflect the realities of developing countries. So they can may contain a lot of biases, not because, that, because they are just there. Uh, they're based on, on English language mainly. Uh, we don't have a lot of, uh, they're not normally, they're not trained on local languages or different, uh, different languages. Uh, they may contain bias that I said that don't reflect the realities of developing countries. So uh, this process of adapting and adjusting those models when applied to developing countries, I think that's something that's very, that's very important. And it's crucial to bring a sense of ownership to developing countries when these this solutions are, 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 are presented. Uh, I think that's what I think it's, I would say at this point, and, and we look forward to discussion. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for, for, for the uh, thoughtful comment. And uh, uh, yeah, it seems that uh, the uh, adapt, adoption to the uh, local conditions will, will be uh, uh, one of the key elements uh, for uh, success uh, 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 to provide uh, a good solution to the community. Uh, and uh, in order to, to uh, possibility a wider possibility for adaptation. Uh, uh, probably the interoperability between different frameworks should be very important. Um, at the same time, 
local versus universal may be a, a kind of different uh, complicated question, but uh, we don't uh, 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 go too much into this uh, as element uh, uh, because of the limit of the time, but uh, maybe uh, we, uh, we need to discuss this point uh, at uh, different uh, occasions. So having listened to the uh, 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 excellent speakers uh, from uh, supply, supply side of the AI economy and also demand side uh, of AI ecosystem, uh, we learned uh, there will be a lot of, a lot of uh, potential uh, for AI technology to provide a lot of benefit to different types of communities and societies. And uh, uh, now uh, we have uh, one uh, uh, speaker from World Bank who has been uh, playing a, a very important role uh, in uh, international uh, cooperation. Uh, especially in my knowledge, uh, uh, World Bank has been very active uh, in uh, uh, development uh, support activities uh, in digital uh, uh, field, uh, especially through uh, digital development uh, partnership. And uh, uh, we uh, have been talking uh, a lot about the uh, leapfrog, potential of leapfrog of provided by digital uh, technology. I personally believe AI brings the, the biggest uh, uh, potential uh, uh, of leapfrog uh, among different types of dif uh, digital technologies. So uh, I would like to invite uh, uh, Daisuke to, to share your thought uh, 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 and uh, your experience uh, uh, and probably uh, your uh, uh, idea to uh, 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 create some chances for collaboration among uh, 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 companies, government, and international organizations uh, to uh, facilitate uh, the uh, benefit uh, pro uh, brought by AI technology in the uh, global uh, economy. So, Daisuke, please. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you very much. And uh, of course, in uh, this year's uh, G7 process, we, uh, as a World Bank, uh, participated for the first time in the framework of the G7 uh, for discussing uh, for further collaboration with the G7 countries uh, to expand the digital uh, digitalization in the developing countries and emerging tech, uh, emerging uh, economies. So, and of course we are, uh, I, I recognize the kind of difficulties of the, uh, the, the getting uh, consensus within the G7 countries. So I think of course, uh, involving beyond the G7 countries on AI is more difficult. But at the same time that we all recognize that the potential of the AI that's why we are now facing this, you know, discuss we are now dis discussing about the potentials and as uh, well as the risks of the AI. And from our perspective in the World Bank, uh, we are, you know, supporting, uh, have been supported for a long time uh, for, of course, uh, developing uh, the economies uh, to mitigate the poverty and enhance the prosperity in globally. And of course, the digital agenda is very new uh, as compared to the you know, traditional uh, infrastructure like the road, uh, energy, or other you know, issues. But more and more, uh, many people are uh, focusing on our activities for digital development. And we have been developing in these uh, areas by uh, through the firstly, of course, the infrastructure uh, construction support. And this is very important to gap uh, the, the field the gaps uh, between the, the connected and unconnected. And this is very important. And of course, this is a foundation to develop the country, uh, develop the country through the digitalization. And but also, uh, this is mostly important. Uh, I, th I think that many people uh, indicated that the gap, uh, filling the gaps of the skills. And this uh, has been done uh, within our framework of the Digital Development Partnership. 
And uh, we have been a lot of uh, capacity building projects, including uh, the kind of many, many develop, developed countries and also the private companies' participation. Of course, the Microsoft and the Meta and our other uh, companies are so uh, actively uh, working with us for expanding, uh, kind of developing uh, these kind of uh, skills in developing countries. And we believe that the expansion of these digital skills will uh, promote the development of in the developing countries and of course to be innovative and uh, you know the like uh, the human centric you know, that the things that you are, you are discussing right now uh, to uh, to be more uh, livable planet we where we go and also uh, for, uh, finally I like to mention about the things uh, that uh, just wait a minute sorry uh, that works oh, sorry. Yes. Okay. So, and uh, I think that more importantly, of course, the regulatory framework is many uh, has been more and more important in terms of the the, uh, the the creating the environment, and of course, you know, the private companies are you know promote uh, trying to promote this you know uh, the AI within their direction. But at the same time, public sectors are just trying to preserve their, the rights of the nations and nationals, and of course, the, you know, the, the human rights, etc., etc. So uh, we are now, at bank, as a, a World Bank, uh, coordinating together with the private companies and the private sec public sectors to uh, find out the best solutions to uh, in the regulatory framework. So this is a kind of some examples, but of course uh, AI is a very new agenda, and of course we are now uh, uh, trying to find out best solutions for enhancing these AI's projects. So I'd be happy to. We are very happy to discuss further with the private companies as well as the public sectors and uh, you know, as a whole, the multi-stakeholders multi to improve this AI's environment. This is a kind of our approach, thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for, for uh, your uh, very uh, proactive comment and uh, uh, some lessons uh, from the previous experiences. Uh, it is uh, uh, good to know uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, potential uh, for collaboration among different uh, stakeholders. So, uh, having discussed uh, among uh, different types of uh, AI uh, players in the ecosystem, uh, we, uh, uh, I uh, hope uh, we have a lot of potential to, to promote uh, collaboration. Uh, and uh, uh, having listened to others' presentation, uh, uh, I would like to ask uh, uh, any uh, one of you, two of you, uh, 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 on, on your thought uh, uh, on what uh, would be the good way to, to uh, proceed for us to promote collaboration among different types of uh, uh, players. Uh, uh, our uh, government will stand uh, close to World Bank and other international organizations to promote collaboration, uh, make use of our knowledge and exp experience uh, to go ahead together. And the Hiroshima process will be one of those uh, uh, instruments. So I would like to, to invite uh, any speaker uh, for volunteer to make a, a, a comment and share your thought. So who can volunteer? So I'm lead first. Thank you. I think this, uh, the collaboration is must because if you look at technologies, they are cross-border and there has to be, collab you know, there is a lot of collaboration required. And I think what can be done um, through people who are experienced in it with World Bank, etc., is provide the necessary trainings in the developing countries as to, you know, what's happening, what 
needs to be secured, what are the you know, rights-based. Many countries are still arriving at those consensus, like, you know, it has to be rights-respecting, as was mentioned. Uh, it has to be gender-respecting. Many times we see gender biased also in the systems. Uh, so I think the training, capacity building, passing the best practices is important, and, I'm, and you all have been doing it through the GPI or the other initiatives also, because they all inter, uh, you know, overlap each other. So I think more dialogue, more capacity building, sharing base, best practices are important, and not only about algorithmic biases, transparency, accountability, but also security, because uh, these systems need to be secured. We see state actors at attacking different countries. We see different uh, bad actors attacking into the system, and if it is hacked, it can be used. A public good can become public bad. Uh, so, you know, even the security aspect, et cetera, is important. And I think those trainings, if they are given, you know, how entrepreneurs can use those best practices, et cetera, I'm sure most governments would be willing to get into those dialogues and benefit from it. Okay, thank you very much for your comment and uh, proposal. Uh, actually, uh, uh, we have been uh, uh, providing uh, uh, capacity building uh, 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 program uh, uh, with, uh, in collaboration with the World Bank, uh, which provides uh, uh, study tours uh, to Japan, uh, inviting uh, the uh, government officials and other, other relevant people from Asian and African developing countries uh, to share our knowledge and exper expertise and also the sum of the practices at uh, private companies in, in Japan. And we have been doing that uh, pro uh, mostly uh, among uh, Japanese relevant uh, companies and people, but maybe uh, we can do that uh, with uh, multinationally uh, together with the players from different countries, uh, such as Meta or uh, Microsoft, uh, uh, in the location of uh, not, not limited to Tokyo, but anywhere else. But uh, uh, we, uh, we can think about uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, capacity building program uh, 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 provided by the World Bank, if possible. But anyway, uh, that can be uh, one of the ideas. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your proposal. And uh, is there any other volunteer? But so, uh, Luciano, please. No, thank you. Yes, I would go along the same lines. I think it's, uh, we, we commend the, the leadership that Japan is playing this, in, this, in this field, but we understand dialogue and cooperation. Dialogue with other uh, initiatives and cooperation with different organizations and countries is, is crucial. Uh, and again, the cooperation is important not only to, for sharing experiences and best practice, but we think that crucially to help building the necessary national capabilities that will be required to, to make sure countries can, around the world can benefit from, from the potential. And again, I think engaging with different development banks uh, is something that would be uh, an interesting perspective uh, in the sense that it would be necessary to leverage investments to those countries that need to, to acquire those, those capabilities. Uh, something from our international institutional perspective, I would mention, uh, considering this, uh, this, this uh, leadership position that Japan is playing right now, I think it's important to strengthen the dialogue with other organizations, also in the sense that it's important to ensure coherence in terms of narratives and policies, to make sure we don't have a fragmentation of spaces where all of these initiatives are being, are being developed. So, uh, in the sense, I think it's, it's important to take consideration uh, we see as a useful, as useful to build some momentum at the UN as well, in terms of achieving, let's say, an overarching uh, narrative in this in this field, and there, of course, all countries are represented, and we can we can uh, make sure that we have a, a debate that is as inclusive as possible in this area. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe uh, avoiding uh, fragmentation and uh, promoting interoperability uh, would be very, very important agenda for us. And uh, we are expecting very much highly uh, uh, about uh, uh, of uh, uh, your presidency uh, of next uh, G20 next year. So any other, probably uh, last uh, volunteer. Who, who wants to be last one here? Okay, just maybe a little bit repeat it from the previous uh, suggestion. So the first and the most is the uh, digital literacy, 
to build the uh, capacity building for the society to become more knowledgeable and understand how to utilize the AI and other aspects. Secondly, I think the, uh, we have to boost the collaboration uh, between the industry, Meta, Microsoft, and others, uh, engaging with the uh, startup, which is in the uh, emerging countries. So this is important to be able to leverage the uh, solution that will be provided by the uh, technology from the uh, startup. Second, and the last part is World Bank, because, and also other maybe uh, venture capital to engage with the uh, uh, startup and other uh, industry because without the venture capital or what bank, I think it's quite diffi difficult during the tech winter right now. We suffer during the tech winter because some of our startup diminish from the ecosystem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, uh, for such a comprehensive and concluding remark. Uh, uh, you took uh, the uh, role of the uh, moderator uh, uh, by your comment. But uh, uh, before ending up, uh, I, uh, let me add one uh, volunteer uh, from industry. Who wants to? Yeah, whoever. Yeah. I think uh, my fellow panelists have shared many good ideas here. I think one thing that works well in the multi-stakeholder context is when uh, a specific uh, challenge is identified um, and that allows you to direct resources uh, into it and to be to make you know more than incremental progress. So I can uh, point to you know, some other multi-stakeholder initiatives, not specifically uh, in the AI context, where we've seen really you know, significant progress in a short period of time. And one of them that I would call out is uh, the Christchurch call. So actually in my home country of New Zealand, there was a, a terrorist attack that was streamed online a first of its kind type of attack that involved uh, terrorist and violent extremist material. And what was so effective in the response to that uh, you know, tragic incident was that uh, governments and civil society and industry came together to work on a very specific problem. And that problem was how do we avoid the proliferation of this terrorist and violent extremist content? And it was a specific problem, but their solution was actually very multifaceted. I mean, industry came up with a, a protocol to respond quickly and avoid the proliferation of that type of content. But it wasn't just a point solution like that. It also involved literacy campaigns, further study by academia as to what the problem space really involved. And so I think as we think about what's next for multi-stakeholder collaboration on AI, I think there's some lessons that we can glean from uh, other past successful multi-stakeholder initiatives. Often they work best when there's a specific targeted problem that everyone's coming together um, uh, to try and address. They work best when their uh, multi-stakeholder initiatives build on what exists already as opposed to reinventing the world. So my hope is that we you know, take the holistic approach here which involves capacity building on you know, the technology front. We mustn't forget that there's a huge digital divide that we still need to close in order to even make access to AI possible in large parts of the world. Um, but we need to remember that fundamentally this is about people. Uh, and so there's a lot of skilling work that uh, is needed for us to be able to truly take advantage of of this AI moment. So I hope we can take those sorts of lessons forward in our uh, multi-stakeholder collaboration on AI. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, in the end, uh, we uh, uh, reconfirm, you know, the human-centric uh, AI and AI society should be very important and that is uh, what uh, we should uh, 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 pursue uh, all together. 
uh, 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 although uh, we take uh, any different uh, approaches or different uh, 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 frameworks. So thank you very much uh, for, for the very uh, uh, active discussion. And uh, uh, sorry about the poor management uh, uh, by the moderator. Uh, we wanted to have a little more time, but uh, 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 still I believe uh, uh, we had a very good discussion. And thank you very much for your attention uh, uh, to the audience. And uh, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, unfortunately, our time is up. But uh, uh, we stay in touch, and we continue our uh, uh, effort uh, together. So thank you. Uh, the session is closed. Thank you very much.